I don't have a prepared paper. I thought I would answer the question I was being asked. And I want to say first that I've been haunted since I was here two years ago by a member of the audience who came down those steps and addressed, there were some politicians on, uh, on a panel and just talked about what it had meant to him when his daughter went to Australia with her family and he knew he wouldn't be able to afford to go there and he thought he'd never see her again. And it was one of those moments, and I, I go to a lot of these events, and of course the public talk. There was one of those things that really sears you, because he said it very well, he said it very movingly, and I think the entire audience was gripped by it, especially the thought that this was, you know, we we're only talking about two years ago, um, a very prosperous country, despite the recession, despite everything else. And I was just wondering if he's here, or if there's anybody here who remembers that and knows if he ever got to see his daughter again and her family. Now, back to the proclamation of the Irish Republic. And I'll come to what Robert was saying a bit later, and he will not expect me to agree with him about much, um, but we are civil to each other. I've just finished writing a book on some of the questions raised um, earlier today, and indeed by Robert. The Seven Signatories of the Irish Republic. My book is called, it's not out yet, it'll be out in March, just before the Reclaim the 1916 um, events. The Seven, the Lives and Legacies of the Founding Fathers of the Irish Republic. And I come to this rather late in the day, in a way, because I wasn't intending to get involved in book writing for this event. I wrote a biography of Patrick Pierce in the late 1970s, which I'm happy to say is still being reprinted because it was, a, I think, an honest book. And even my, those people who disapprove of my politics know that I tried to make it an honest book. And he was a very interesting man. Um, so the book is still around. And I've always been tremendously interested. You know, the new books that came up on that period I've read. I wrote a short biography of James Connolly. There's something about those people that fascinates me. As a journalist, I've written about this from time to time. As I say, I keep up with the subject. And then a lot of books were being written for 1916, and I suddenly felt nobody seems to be addressing the central point. Who were there? There are lots of biographies of individual signatories of the Irish Proclamation, and more keep coming out by the month. But they're not Talk, they're, they're all, in a funny way, um, bit players in each other's stories. So you don't get a sense of the chemistry between them. Who brought whom into it? How did X get involved? Who was led by whom? Um, what were the in, how did they influence each other? And what did they want? And that's one of the most interesting things, because Robert's pretty clear about what they wanted. Um, I don't think anybody's really looked closely at the proclamation could feel that they had worked much out. And certainly when you get to do research on them and you really get to look at them individually, it's clear that they were very, very different people. And that that's one of the reasons that as a group, they really did not much address anything about what they wanted afterwards. There's a point, I think, made by Dermot Ferreter quoting Charles Townsend, you know, the self and self-determination. What were they actually, what did they actually want? apart from this terribly visionary statement. Now, I mean, Patrick Pierce, and I will say this to anybody, I think in, I think in some ways he was nuts. I also think he's a very attractive, uh, selfless, brave man. But I do think, fundamentally, he was a very, very troubled man. Uh, he was the most brilliant propagandist. He was extraordinary. And this is his document, with a bit of influence, a little bit of inspiration from James Connolly. But just look at the small, I mean, just read it. You know, this is supposed to be for the nation, all the people of Ireland. Let's just think about it. Now, to me, this comes across as a profoundly partitionist document, as indeed the Ulster Covenant, which was published two years earlier, was a profoundly partitionist government. But at least the Ulster Covenant, signed by half a million people, declared itself essentially partitionist. 
you know, it did not want to be part of a united Ireland, and not did not want any part of that at all. It did not want home rule. It wanted to be part of the United Kingdom. This document, our proclamation, declared itself to be for all the people of Ireland. And from the very beginning, it makes it impossible for unionists to sign up to it. You know, in the name of God and of the dead generations, well, they might agree on God, right? They're not going to agree on the dead generations from which she receives her whole old nation, tradition of nationhood. They're not. Paragraph two, having organized and trained her manhood through her secret revolutionary organization, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, well, that's certainly going to bring the unionists on board. Thanks very much. They've been very much aware of the Irish Republican Brotherhood and various things it's been doing for 50 or 60 years, including the dynamiting and the rest of it. Now, this is not going to attract them. Um, Fintan Lawler does get a hat tip in the bit about the ownership of Ireland, but it's not at all made clear who are to be the owners. There's absolutely no suggestion it's going to be the landless peasants. It's um, probably going to be the strong farmers, as it always is, and always has been. Um, the Irish Republic is entitled to, and hereby claims, the allegiance of every Irish man and every Irish woman. Who says? Says who is what? A lot of people. We're going to ask, and indeed the entire unionist population. Who are they? Who the hell do they think they are? Well, they are seven people who are a tiny cabal within the IRB who don't even tell the Supreme Council of the IRB what they're doing, who subvert the IRB and the Irish volunteers and every organization like the GAA and the Gaelic League and the rest of it because they want to get the Brits out. And that's what it all comes down to in the end. They were, I have to say, and I have spent a lot of time with them in the last few years, they are an extraordinary bunch of people. And I find it very hard not to admire many of them and many aspects of them, and to feel affection for them, and to feel what a shame it was that they took the path they took. They were brave, they were selfless. I don't think they had a clue what they were doing. I think they were caught up in war fever. And I'm absolutely sure they didn't agree on what they wanted because they avoided talking about it. James Connolly wanted a Marxist international state, essentially. It's a Marxist, right. Uh, Patrick Pierce wanted some kind of prelapsarian return to old Celtic world. But sometimes, in certain moods, like in the GPO, he and Plunkett agreed that what they, we needed was a German prince, a German Catholic prince, one of the Kaiser's children, uh, to become our leading, our monarch. And in time, he would learn to speak Irish and all would be well. Eamon Kent, who most people forget, uh, the only one of them who was really a formidable soldier during the Rising. He was an exceptional man in those respects. But Eamon Kent would have absolutely insisted on a, a compulsory Irish for everybody at every stage. He was a completely rigid Irish Islander. Um, Sean McDermott was Tom Clark's sidekick. Tom Clark, without Tom Clark, there would have been no rebellion, no rising, no insurrection, call it what you like. Couldn't have happened without him. Extraordinary man. Um, and his sidekick, Sean McDermott, was his, his eyes and ears and mouth. He was extraordinary too. They were all extraordinary in their way. The poets, you know, I'm very fond of McDonough and Plunkett. You couldn't be, but be. But who the hell do they think they were? It was those seven people to decide that they were going to create, to take over the state. They had absolutely, they no, the only one that ever stood for election was Connolly, who got nowhere. They never stood for election of any kind. It was an extraordinary thing to do. They had no more right to do it than we do, just taking one, two, three, four, three people from the audience at random. Let's have a revolution, lads. Seven of us. We know that this country is going wrong. We will have a revolution. And what's more, I'm a journalist. I'll write you a jolly nice proclamation. It'll be terribly visionary, and it'll all about, pe about people being equal. And in the end, this is what Robert's talking about. Do you think the men of 1916, I mean, God help them, what would they have thought of Ireland now? Do they have a clue? Um, I'm damn sure what they wouldn't have wanted to see was dissident groups and split groups fighting over what, how even to commemorate them. I mean, the, the government has been 
And I absolutely agree with those who say it was preposterous to suggest a member of the royal family coming. I kept having a vision of poor old Prince Edward, who was, you know, the junior royal sent to the things nobody else was prepared to do, lurking somewhere, you know, trying to, trying to look okay. It would have been ludicrous for everybody. Uh, but I understand why they wanted to be inclusive. Of course they did. These were seven people who decided to start an insurrection. And as a result of it, an awful, mostly citizens of Dublin got killed. They're the ones who mostly got killed. Also, uh, policemen, Catholic Irish, Catholic policemen who thought they were Irish. Quite a lot of soldiers who thought they were Irish and who were Irish. Um, the shooting of the odd unarmed policeman, that was not a distinguished thing to do. So, um, one of the things the proclamation says is, we demand your allegiance regardless of your loyalties. This was not an inclusive document. It included everybody that was prepared to sign up to what they thought Ireland was, but not anybody else, and certainly not the unionists. There was no room for them. There was the one reference to cherishing the children of the country equally, which everybody's, most people have misunderstood, uh, which was supposed to take in the unionists. They knew nothing of unionism. They knew nothing of the people in Northern Ireland. They were wholly unrealistic. And all these years on, what we've had is, in the name of these people, the likes of the IRA, murdering, murdering in the name of these people for a united Ireland and entrenching partitionism. Because I tell you this now, and I know unionists well, and I could come back to it, I've written about them, I know them well. There was a chance of seducing them into a united Ireland. There was never a possibility of bombing and killing them into it. So when, whatever carry-on is on the 23rd of April, whenever it 24th. is, 24th, um, you know, great. And uh, no doubt there'll be a separate, there'll be, Sinn Féin will be running that one. The they government will have no, done... they won't. Well, it was the dissidents now, it's the 1916 no, societies. My, oh, you? my committee. Okay, so you'll have a committee which is encompassing everybody. Sinn Féin will have done theirs. The 1916 societies, and I've addressed them, I know what they're at. Um, they'll all be having the separate ones, and the government, and everything else, and we'll do all this in the name of Irish unity. Ha, bloody ha. Thank you.